Good Friday evening to you from our studios in Caracas, Venezuela. My name is Regan Devines. We begin with a look at this evening's headlines. Former Guatemalan dictator Efrain Rios Montt has been denied amnesty in the trial for his role in a massacre in the early 80s. The annual meeting of the IMF and the World Bank is underway in Peru with climate change and a slowing global economy on the agenda. And we have a special report on the call for an uprising after six Palestinians were killed by Israeli troops. The details on these stories and more right now on From the South. Thank you for being here with us. We begin with former Guatemalan dictator Efrain Rios Montt, who is facing a second trial on genocide and has been denied amnesty by the Court of Appeals. Rios Montt had asked for amnesty to avoid the second trial for his part in the massacre of over 1,700 Mayan exiles in the north of the country between 1982 and 1983. He was found guilty in 2013 and sentenced to 80 years in jail. But the ruling was revoked by the Constitutional Court for alleged errors in the process and has to be repeated. His lawyers have succeeded at prolonging the new hearing for almost four years now. Rios Montt will now face a trial in absentia to start on January 11th next year. However, the dictator will not be sent to jail. Eight days after the tragic landslide in Guatemala, the number of victims continues to rise, with authorities now confirming 237 deaths. Hundreds are still missing after the landslide covered houses, and each day there is less hope for finding survivors. 25,000 cubic meters of dirt have been removed, and they are still on high alert for a possible repeat landslide. Anyone who is loyal to the former Colombian president, Alvaro Uribe, is considered one of the new terrorists, according to the Senate Peace Commission. Congressman Roy Barrera said that the Democratic Center Party formed by Uribe is dedicated to simulating fear and is a new form of terrorism. Barreras made the comments during a debate in Congress of the potential constitutional reforms that would be needed to allow for the implementation of a peace agreement, which is currently being debated between the government of Colombia and the FARC rebels in Havana, Cuba. Masked men have shot dead eight people in a neighborhood of Honduras's capital, Tegucigalpa. The attackers opened fire indiscriminately at a mechanic's garage in the neighborhood of El Sitio, where the Mara Salvatrucha gang operates. They arrived in a white van and fled the location after the shooting. According to statistics, Honduras is the second most violent country in the world. Violent gangs charge a so-called war tax to small businesses, people, buses and taxis, and under the threat of murder if they do not pay. Brazil's president, Dima Rousseff, has begun a state visit to Colombia with economic relations at the top of her agenda. President Juan Manuel Santos welcomed the Brazilian leader with full military honors to the Nariño Palace in Bogotá. The two leaders Ingres. signed agreements on trade, agriculture, e uh, education and scientific research. Rousseff also congratulated Santos on his peace process with the FARC guerrillas. I want to take the opportunity, President Santos, to bring you the thanks of Brazil and my own personal tribute for your courageous decision to implement the peace process here in Colombia with the Revolutionary Armed Forces, for beginning this process which all of South America and this hemisphere is proud of. I think we will be able to go to the Olympic Games with the Olympic flame of peace. I think that would be important. The Olympics began with a peace process many years ago in Greece, so I think it could be the host of a process that puts an end to the last and only armed conflict in the whole Western Hemisphere. And before leaving for Colombia, President Rousseff met with her new cabinet on Thursday evening after the audit court declared the government's accounts for 2014 illegal. The ruling comes on top of another one by the Electoral Court, which ordered a probe into alleged irregularities in Rousseff's 2014 re-election campaign. In addition to this, Rousseff failed on Wednesday to gather enough votes to sustain her vetoes on important budget laws. Some believe that these situations hand ammunition to opponents who seek her impeachment. 
However, Rusev's brand new chief of staff has praised his strength. President Rusev is a warrior. She does very well precisely in difficult situations. Clearly, she would have preferred a different result from the audit court analysis, but she took the decision with respect, and she understands that we have to turn the page and fight the battle at judgment time, which will happen at Congress. Also in Brazil, Alba social movements gathered in Sao Paulo to launch an anti-imperialist conference that will start on November 1st. The attendees debated the continent's current challenges on popular struggle. During the event, they remembered the People's Summit held in Mar del Plata, Argentina, which rejected the U.S.-dominated free trade area of the America's proposal. Thanks to late Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez, as well as former Brazilian President Luis Inácio da Silva. And also in Sao Paulo, hundreds of taxis blocked the city hall on Thursday in another protest against U.S.-based private car provider Uber. The city's mayor plans to issue 5,000 permits for a new class of taxis called Black Cabs, which will transfer passengers using the Uber service. The bill is not to the liking of taxi drivers, nor Uber itself, which does not want to be classified as a taxi service. The annual IMF and World Bank annual meeting concluded its second day in Lima, Peru. The head of the IMF, Christine Lagarde, said that the institution is pushing for greater and more inclusive growth as the global economy is slowing. She also believes that a carbon tax should be introduced to combat climate change. Despite these efforts, the World Bank has been heavily criticized for its poor record on implementing, implementing environmental safeguards. And Latin America's Pacific Alliance yeah. countries, namely Peru, yeah. Chile, yeah. Colombia and Mexico, gathered on the sidelines of the IMF and World Bank annual meeting. The four countries of the Pacific Alliance also stated yeah. that the current yeah. context of the sharp decline in prices of raw materials yeah. exported is a major challenge for the bloc, which represents about 35% of gross domestic product in Latin America. Also at the meeting, the group of 24 uh, developing nations, which aims to represent the developing world, says that its members want a greater role in institutions governing the global economy. And popular Hollywood actor Sean Penn weighed in on the climate change debate, saying that something had to be done urgently. It is the, it, that it's the first time in human history where, do, whether it's due to climate change issues, or dirty bombs, wealth alone will not assure comfort for you or your families. Bolivia is hosting its, the second uh, World People's Conference on Climate Change this weekend, and President Evo Morales says the country will push for far-reaching measures to tackle the problem. The UN's Ban Ki-moon will join 8,000 delegates from more than 40 countries at the event. Telesur's Dimitri O'Donnell is there in Bolivia, and he filed this report. Our planet is getting warmer and scientists say this is because of climate change. On the congested streets of La Paz, bumper to bumper traffic is contributing to the greenhouse gas effect and this is the hot topic at the People's Climate Change Conference taking place in Bolivia this weekend. You can see the change that the varial weather generates, like more frost, more rain, less rain and even drought in the different regions. Environmental activists are calling on developed countries to pay their climate debt. For its part, Bolivia wants to stop deforestation, but first it has to improve its own record. In the case of Bolivia, more than 66% of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions of Bolivia come from deforestation. So if we want to fight against climate change in Bolivia, we have to halt deforestation. In La Paz, there's huge excitement about a soccer qualifier for the next World Cup. But Bolivia is also hoping to score in another way by persuading nations to sign up to climate change reform. It's uh, important as well to think about Mother Earth, that we have as human beings a responsibility with Mother Earth. And I think that's going to be the most important contribution of the Tiki Paya too. Bolivia says it wants to defend Mother Earth and is asking every nation attending the Cochabamba conference to do the same. 
proposals to combat climate change will be discussed and put forward at the Paris Environmental Summit at the end of the year. Dimitri O'Donnell, Telesur, La Paz. A bust of Eva, Evita Peron in a park in Havana has been inaugurated this Friday, five years after its placement. The statue was to be inaugurated by late President Nestor Kirchner, but his sudden, sudden death forced its postponement. During today's ceremony, the government highlighted Evita's, Evita's struggle for the rights of the impoverished. Argentina's foreign minister said that the late second wife of Juan Peron would have been the first to demand the end of the U.S. blockade on the island had she still been here. Countries in the English-speaking Caribbean have been receiving poor international tourism reviews as their beaches continue to be infested with a massive amount of invasive sargassum seaweed. The seaweed is also provided, providing to be a troublesome situation for the agricultural sector and a nuisance for residents. Now, St. Lucia is moving to help itself by trying to get rid of as much of the sargassum seaweed as possible. The sargassum seaweed situation in St. Lucia does not appear to be going away anytime soon. Some scientists say the increase started in 2011 due to warmer sea temperatures and changes in ocean currents. As governments across the Caribbean scramble to find a solution to the invasive seaweed, which is affecting fisheries, tourism, agriculture and life in coastal areas, communities across St. Lucia are trying to help themselves. In Denry South, residents are trying to take the advice of regional academics and dispose of as much of the seaweed as possible while devising innovative methods of use. We had with us um, a backhoe and also an excavator, as you could see in the background today, is still operating. And um, generally what we did were to dig a few holes on the beach, huge holes on the beach, and to scrape off as much sargassum as we could from the beachfront into the holes and to bury them. While the seaweed is a problem for the industries, it is a troubling situation for those who live near the beaches. They say they welcome the moves to remove the unsightly, putrid algae. The smell is, I, frankly, it's, un, it's unbearable. So I think what they're doing there is a measure to alleviate that. Sargassum has washed up ashore in the Caribbean for many years, but experts say the amount and frequency have skyrocketed in recent times. Some countries, like Barbados, have requested emergency funds to clear the seaweed, which can pile up to over 10 feet on some beaches. The Caribbean's peak tourism season is about to get underway. Tourism and agriculture authorities are hoping to find methods of coping with the stubborn problem in a region that is heavily dependent on tourism. Alison Kentish, Delisur, St. Lucia. And coming up after the break, the secretive TPP deal is not so secret now. This is because WikiLeaks has made the chapter on intellectual property available. The story and more next. Behind the power, we lift the lid on some of the world's most ruthless figures. Open file, only on telesurtv.net in English. Wherever the news, you'll be there. An insight into Africa today with Bill Fletcher. The Global African, only on telesurtv.net in English. Wherever the news, you'll be there. We need to understand the world we live in. We require news with critical points of view, thorough analysis and social commitment. This information is vital to think, to understand and to change. The world demands a new perspective. Telesurtv.net forward slash English. Wherever the news, you'll be there. Six Palestinians were shot dead by Israeli troops in Gaza, and the leader of Hamas has called for the strengthening of a new intifada. Our correspondent Noor Harazin reports from Gaza. On Friday afternoon, clashes between angry Palestinian protesters and the Israeli occupation forces erupted at the Nahal Oz military site, eastern Gaza Strip. 
the clashes spread to include eastern Khan Yunus in Farahin neighborhood, causing the death of an 18-year-old Palestinian teen. Medical teams in this trip announced their utter readiness for dealing with any further developments. According to Gaza's Ministry of Health, the clashes in eastern Gaza City and eastern Khan Yunis resulted in a toll death of five Palestinian young men and about 30 injuries. The Israeli occupation forces were taking position far from us and we moved toward them throwing stones. From the watchtower, sniper shot at some youths. The Islamic Jihad movement staged Friday a massive rally in the Gaza Strip in support of Jerusalem and the popular uprising which broke out recently in the West Bank against the Israeli settlers and occupation forces. The march, entitled Jerusalem, Our Direction for Struggle, gathered at Al Umari Mosque in Gaza City after the Friday prayer and headed towards Palestine Square with the participation of Islamic Jihad leaders and members of various Palestinian resistance factions and Gaza officials. Palestinian prisoners and a big one of the Islamic Jihad martyr, leader Fatih Shaqaqi. Then they burned the Israeli flag and called for revenge for the Palestinian bloodshed. The Battle of Jerusalem is our battle, and the Intifada in the West Bank is our nation's Intifada. We will not be late to be in the right place as always, and to do always the right action in support of our nation. Similar anger marches were held at the Palestinian refugees camps in Lebanon, alongside with Gaza's Central Rally, figuring a cry of anger and warning to the Zionist enemy over its criminal practices against the Palestinian people. Nur Harazin Tilisu TV, Gaza. Whistleblower WikiLeaks has made available to the public the final agreed version of the Trans-Pacific Partnerships Chapter on Intellectual Property Rights. The chapter deals with copyright, trademark and patent law. Over the past two years, WikiLeaks has actively been seeking and publishing chapters of the TPP deal which has been negotiated behind closed doors for years between 12 Pacific countries. There are widespread concerns that the TPP will benefit the corporate world at the expense of human rights and access to medicine. According to Iran's revolutionary guards as well as Iranian media, one of their generals has been killed by Islamic State. The general, whose name is Hussein Hamidani, had reportedly been an advisor to Syria's President Bashar al-Assad in the country's fight against ISIS. Iran's Revolutionary Guard said that Hamidami was killed by the terrorist group during an advisory mission. According to Russia's Defense Ministry, they have killed 300 extremists in their latest airstrikes in Syria. The Russian forces destroyed a militant group headquarters, killing 200 insurgents, while a further 100 were killed in a separate attack. However, IS fighters have reportedly seized the villages close to the city of Aleppo from rival insurgents. Russia's defense ministry says that its strikes will be stepped up just as Saudi Arabia has says it has increased its weapon supplies to three different arms groups in Syria. And the Pentagon has announced the end of a $500 million scheme to train and equip 15,000 rebels to fight the Islamic State in Syria. This announcement comes on the heels of U.S. Defense uh, Secretary Ashton Carter's talks in London about the wars in Syria and Iraq. Instead, the Pentagon will now concentrate only on training key leaders of groups that have been identified for fighting, fighting ISIL. Uh, Libya has finally formed a national unity government. This, one, uh, this was announced late Thursday evening by the United Nations envoy for the African country. The announcement comes after months of negotiations between the country's two rival administrations. The agreement promises to bring peace to a country that has been torn apart by civil war since the year 2011. The new national government will be headed by Prime Minister Fayez al-Saraj. All of them will work as a team. We don't have the time now to dwell on details on the voting system, but this will be a team. Their votes are expected to have the same value in the first rounds of 
voting and then in the process, of course, a system to overcome possible blockades will be agreed, but all of them, I insist, will have similar importance and all of them will have to work as a team. The United Nations Security Council has approved the use of force by the European Union in the Mediterranean Sea to combat people smugglers. With 14 votes in favor and the abstention of Venezuela, the resolution was passed so that European forces can inspect, capture and render unusable boats on the sea, which are suspected of being used for people smuggling. And Hungary has thus far tried over 400 refugees, mostly Iraqis and Syrians, in courts of law for entering the country illegally. The move comes after a recent law was passed after the country erected razor-wire fences along its border with Serbia. The law has reflected a hardline re rejection to refugees and of the refugee crisis. The, refugee will all, the refugees will all be deported after sentencing. Presidents from Central Europe have demanded more support from the European Union in dealing with the ongoing flow of refugees across their borders. The V4 group, which is made up of Poland, the Czech Republic, Hungary and Slovakia, met with the president of Croatia in Hungary to discuss aid for refugees passing through their countries, as well as the possible security risks. Speaking during a news conference, Croatia's president emphasized the importance of strict border, uh, strict border controls and added that they cannot allow potential terrorists and people smugglers to hide among the refugees. We move to another continent now. In August of 2015 alone, more than 30,000 unaccompanied minors were detained in their attempt to cross the Mexican border into the United States. This number is more than half than the amount of minors who were detained back in 2014. Bianca Perez has the details. Many of these children were hopeful that their lives will be drastically changed when they arrive to the U.S., but they do not anticipate the hardships they would endure during their trips and once they entered. Everything that they endured during that time, crossing with smugglers, the walking, what might have happened to them, which sometimes they share with us and sometimes they don't, all of these things affect them. When that child arrives, now you have to add the realization that what they thought is not reality. Another reality which these minors are exposed to in the U.S. is being held in detention centers, which for the most part have been criticized for their violation of human rights. Kids who arrive, unaccompanied minors who arrive from Central America under U.S. law, um, are entitled to a full hearing in an immigration court. And while they're waiting for that hearing under the law, they have to be detained in the least restrictive setting. In the end, these places are jails. They are locked away and this brings about mental health situations for the parents, but also the children who do not understand why they are there. There are also accusations of abuse from the guards in these centers. Immigrant detention centers in the U.S. were created to hold people for a maximum of 72 hours. However, there are currently 2,700 detainees in the facilities in Texas and Pennsylvania who have been waiting for months to see what their future holds. Bianca Perez, Telesur, Washington, D.C. After much speculation all week, the winner of the Nobel Peace Prize has finally been announced. It has been awarded to the Tunisian National Dialogue Quartet. The group, were, the group was rewarded for its decisive contribution to the building of a pluralistic democracy in Tunisia in the wake of the 2011 Jasmine Revolution. Sharing this massive $972,000 prize, Awudad Bouchamawi, Hussein Abbasi Abdesatar, Ben Muasa, and Mohamed Fadhel Mahmoud. World Cup season has begun and has taken hold of avid supporters as several matches were played to see who would qualify for soccer's biggest tournament. We start off in Chile, who made history by beating five-time champions Brazil with a score of 2-0. Next to Colombia, who won two goals to nil against Peru in their South American qualifier. Finally, Ecuador thrilled their fans with a shock win against Argentina with a score of 2-0. The final score proved to be a huge upset for the Argentinians, who were beaten on their home turf.
To celebrate 500 years of the Cuban capital, Havana, the flamboyant Chinese pianist Lang Lang and the legendary Cuban pianist Chuco Valdez will play together. Both musicians will perform pieces written by famous Cuban pianist and composer Ernesto Lecuona, as well as classics from Gershwin, Tchaikovsky and Elgar. And to close this Friday evening, it's been 35 years since the death of Beatles legend John Lennon. But the memory of his life and work is still as fresh as ever. The young and young at heart gathered at New York's Strawberry Fields to pay homage to one of the biggest stars the world has ever seen. Fans sung old Beatles songs, many of which are still relevant today, with peace and love as key themes on a day that would have been John, Legend, John Lennon's rather, 75th birthday. <laughs> I cannot confuse John Legend with John Legend, Lennon anymore. And that's it for us here at Taylor Sur on this Friday evening. Remember, there is more on these and other stories on our website, taylorsurtv.net slash English, from our news teams in Quito, Ecuador, and right here in Caracas, Venezuela. My name is Reagan Devines. Have a great weekend. We hope to see you on Monday.